Rosenberg, and Kev Moe at Martin Luther King Auditorium, MLK Middle School, 1781 Rose Street in Berkeley, on November 5th, 6th, and 7th. For more information, visit www.dopcampaign.org or call 586-754-8105. The University of Creation Spirituality presents a dialogue with economist David Corton and theologian Matthew Fox on Beyond Empire, the next step to spiritual maturity. The dialogue will be on November 4th at 7 p.m. at 2141 Broadway in Oakland. Tickets are $15. For more information, call 510-835-4827, extension 11, or visit www.creationspirituality.org. Latino Music Royalty, Kachow, and Cena Stone All-Stars 7-Piece Ensemble light up San Francisco for a special benefit dance concert on November 30th at 8 p.m. at the Gift Center Pavilion, 888 Brannon Street in San Francisco. For more information, call Laura at 415-391-0944. The community calendar is produced by members of the KPFA Apprenticeship Program. Send your listing at least three weeks in advance to KPFA, Box 51, 1929 Martin Luther King Jr. Way in Berkeley, California, 94704. Or fax them to 510-848-3812. Attention to the community calendar. Tell us if your event is wheelchair accessible. To hear this calendar again, call 510-848-6767, extension 621. That's 510-848-6767, extension 621. The community calendar is also available online at www.kpfa.org. It's 701 and you're listening to KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno. Stand by for Apex Express. Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Cultural coverage, music and calendar, new visions and voices, coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Welcome to Apex Express. On tonight's show, local organizations mobilize immigrant communities for the upcoming elections, and workers from the Kington Restaurant in Chinatown file for back wages. Also, come on over and have some mermaid meat. And other ghost stories, Brenda wong Aoki and Mark Isu join us to talk about this year's Ghost Festival. I'm your host, Rain Giesler. Stay tuned. You're listening to Apex Express on KPFA. My name is Rain. Immigrant communities and communities of color have historically been left out of the electoral process. Factors including language barriers, economic and social inequities, and access have all been challenges for our communities. This election year, there has been a major push to outreach to immigrant communities to mobilize the vote. Joining us to talk about the work that they have been doing in the community is Andrea Cristina Mercado. She is the community organizer for Mujeres Unidas y Activas. Also with us is Juan Angeles, Youth Coordinator for Filipinos for Affirmative Action and also the Coordinator with the Filipino American Voter Initiative. And they're both part of the Immigrant Votes Campaign, and I want to thank you both for joining us on Apex Express today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So you've both been out there working hard in different communities um, to mobilize people to vote, especially now that the election's right around the corner what has the work been like out there? And just talk about what you've been doing. Well, I think uh, we published a voter guide, uh, an immigrant voter guide, which takes a position on uh, about eight propositions, actually, um, in the state of California. And we developed these voter guides together with Ron and a lot of other immigrant groups in the area and sort of came to a decision on which propositions are going to benefit immigrants and which ones are going to you know, hurt immigrants. Um, and so we've really been go- taking to the streets with these voter guides and getting them out. And there's, you know, yesterday, for example, we've been out in the mission in San Francisco, and in under an hour we had, you know, uh, given out over 300 voter guides. 
I just think there's an incredible, people want to know what's on the ballot and they want to be more informed and um, hear a little bit more analysis about them. And Juan, what have you been doing in the Filipino community and with the Filipino Voter Initiative? We've been registering people to vote uh, the last couple of weeks. And this week especially, we're just trying to do GOTV activities, get out the vote activities. And um, we have been using the MIV proposition guide, um, the one Andrea is talking about, with the eight propositions that most likely affect the immigrant community. And aside from that, we've been doing phone banking, calling up Filipino infrequent voters in the Alameda and Contra Costa County and reminding them to vote, also doing voter education workshops in Contra Costa and Alameda County. Why do you think it's important to organize in these communities? What have historically been the issues that the communities are facing around voting? Well, I mean, for us, I think we've just seen that, you know, for example, in the 2000 elections, People of color make up a huge percentage of the vote. Latinos in particular uh, were 34% of the population of California in 2000, but yet they only represented 14% of the vote. And I think the same is true of um, Asian American and African American voters. They just don't turn out as frequently as um, white voters, for, for example. So, I mean, I think we've this election we've really been trying to change that and really um, help people overcome barriers to voting. And Juan, do you want to talk about um, why it's important to organize in the Filipino community and the issues that people are facing around voting? Yeah, um, there are so many Filipinos in the Bay Area, and a lot of them are not registered to vote, although they're eligible. And the people who are registered to vote do not go out and vote. And since there's such a majority of us in the Bay Area, we have the uh, capacity to affect the, the, um, the outcome of the election. And so what we're trying to do is just trying to get all the Filipinos together, mobilize them to go out and vote, and exercise their right to vote. That's the voice of Juan Angeles, and he's a youth counselor for Filipinos for Affirmative Action. He's also a coordinator with the Filipino American Voter Initiative. Also on the line is Andrea Cristina Mercado, who is a community organizer for Mujeres Unidas y Activas. You both mentioned the propositions that um, you're highlighting. Do you want to talk about a few of the propositions that folks should look out for? Um, I know one that we've really been highlighting at Mujeres Unidas is Proposition 63, which is uh, a tax on millionaires in California um, to pay for mental health services for low-income immigrants and and children and families. And I think that's something that's really been important for our members because a lot of our members come from violent situations or um, difficult situations caused by poverty um, and a lot of other factors being an immigrant in California. And there's a tremendous need for mental health services, but yet there's so many bar- barriers to receiving it. Um, so I think that's something that our organization has really rallied around and has really been supporting. And we're recommending a yes vote on 63. And Juan, do you want to give a shout out for a proposition? Sure. Um, we've been asking um, the people we've been phone banking um, what their views on on Proposition 66 and 72, and Proposition 66 is the um, uh, the street three strikes law, and um, I guess you know we're we're talking to the community about that because uh, we think it's important that it it should be changed, and that uh, people should not be going, you know, into prison 25 years to life on a third strike for uh, you know a nonviolent felony. So um, we've been trying to let people know that, you know, a lot of the people in prison serving um, 25 years to life because of the three strikes law uh, due to nonviolent uh, crimes affects uh, the immigrant population mostly. So we've been talking about that. And to add that on 66, I think for a lot of our members, it's just been an education to look at what's considered a felony because I think a lot of people think felonies are violent crimes and are really surprised to learn that, you know, shoplifting can be a felony or a lot of other petty thefts can be a felony. So we've definitely also been doing some outreach and education on that as well. And also Prop 72, do you want to talk about that? Prop 72 basically is health care for workers. And um, we think it's important that all large and mid-sized companies, you know, pay for, um, you know, health insurance for their employees. Um, a lot of them 
do have the money to do this, but are trying to avoid that. And uh, we're just, you know, trying to educate the community and pushing them to vote for Proposition 72 because we think it's just fair that these rich companies, you know, treat their employees well and pay for at least 80% of their health insurance premiums. And do you want to give out some contact info for your organizations? Well, we've been recommending that um, immigrant folks check out our voter guide, which we have in over five languages, I think. And that's available online at www.immigrantvoice.org slash MIV2004. Otherwise, they can get in touch with our organizations and ask for a voter guide, and we'll make sure that they get one. So you can reach Mujeres Unidas y Activas. Our San Francisco office number is 415-621-8140. And for more information about the Mobilize the Immigrant Vote campaign, dial extension 301. And Juan? Uh, yeah, you can contact Filipinos for Affirmative Action in Oakland at 510-465-9876, or you can look us up on the web at Filipinos, the number four, action.org. Great. I want to thank both of you for joining us on Apex Express. Andrea Cristina Mercado and Juan Angelis, both part of the Immigrant Votes Campaign. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having us. Yes, this is music off the new Slam Bush official mixtape produced by Hard Knock Records, and that's lyrics born with the last trumpet. This is a kickin' CD with lots of hip-hop artists and spoken word artists, and you can get yours at www.hardknockrecords.com. They're having a CD release party, a Slam Bush mixtape release party at Lucas, 2221 Broadway at West Grand Avenue in Oakland. 10 to 2, and that's this Saturday, 21 and up. So check it out. Check out hardknockrecords.com. Open your minds without question, no doubt. Tell me what you're thinking about, but try to set aside pride and clout. Can you believe I feel the same exact way you do? You truly do believe these monoliths have fooled you. Systems exist so we never meet each other. Pretty soon from now they're outlaw the word brother. And that's true if they see you walking with a crew. If you don't know, that means more than two. I'll tell you what they'll do. They'll pull over, hunt you over, kick your ass like stick to your shoulder. I know it's unjust as if it wasn't enough. If you try to fight back, they're locking your ass up, and Chuck already told you that I smell as hell, but I'm waiting for the phone song for a spell, call the guard, tell them I'm a piece of God, with no beliefs in the streets so or boulevard, I eat raids so my mental is hard, and the heat from my anger just melted the bars, they reach 
reach for the gun, so I put him to sleep. Break the chains and put the shoes back on my feet. He's on the loose with no discernible scars or marks. Just the mind of Mandela and the heart of Rosa Parks. So I did. Time to see the governor and man. Tell him life ain't fair. See if they care. Well, they do, but only if they are the end. So they appear to have a heart and make a flare. But they haven't done shit for us, and that's a fact. Their only function is to keep the funny money where it's at. The battle continues over minimum wage. Last November, San Francisco voters approved Proposition L, which raised the minimum wage to $8.50 an hour for all workers in San Francisco. Although Proposition L went into effect, no funds were allocated for wage enforcement during the last budget cycle. So many employers have yet to implement the new wage, and many workers are still not aware of the new wage and are working without pay. Known as one of the oldest and most popular restaurants in San Francisco's Chinatown, King Tin Restaurant closed in July after workers organized and contacted state labor officials about months of unpaid wages. Joining us today on Apex to talk about this campaign is Lian Chao. He is the chair of the Chinese Progressive Association. Also joining us is Alex Tom, the campaign director for the Chinese Progressive Association, and Tom Pak Wai, who is also known as Uncle Tam, who is a worker who was a worker at the Kington restaurant for 20 years. I want to welcome you all to Apex Express. Thank you. So let's start with you, Leon. What was the working situation for the workers at the Kington restaurant? Well, Kington restaurant is probably one of the typical examples on there's a huge of, uh, wage and uh, overtime violation in, in the restaurant industry in, in Chinatown with lot of abuse you know I mean the, the workers can be paid for a certain amount of money um, which range from a thousand dollars or you know uh, fourteen hundred dollars and they will be asked to work you know without overtime compensation for you know 60 hours average 60 hours a week in some extreme cases it could up work up to 90 hours a week and without uh, any compensation on, on overtime. So it's break down to, you know, by hour, it could be only work as as uh, as less as $4 an hour. And this isn't a typical example on what the uh, house widespread abuse is. The census through 2000s, there's estimate about 11,000 workers, Chinese workers working the restaurant industry in San Francisco because, you know, Everybody know that you know we're, uh, who come to San Francisco can understand they enjoy the good, the low prices, the cheap food and delicious food in in Chinatown. But they have to understand that because of the price of the man, the menu price of the Chinatown restaurant or Chinese restaurant in, around San Francisco is so low, is because it's subsidized by a substandard wage from the workers, which create a substandard communities. That's the voice of Lian Chao. He is the chair of the Chinese Progressive Association. And today we're talking about wage inequities in Chinatown and in San Francisco in general. Also joining us is Alex Tom, who is the campaign coordinator for the Chinese Progressive Association, and Tom Pak Wai, who is a worker at Kington Restaurant. Let's hear from Uncle Tam. Talk about your experience working at the Kington Restaurant. How long have you been working there and... What has this working conditions been like for you? Uh, I just worked there for over uh, about um, 20 years at Kington Restaurant. Mr. Tam was working at Kington as a kitchen steward, uh, receiving and stocking all like, different goods and um, products. And his schedule now was, um, was working from 8 to 4 p.m. And of seven days a week. When the restaurant opened in 1984, that's when he started and working all the way until the restaurant shut down on uh, July 16th of this year. What was it like for other workers there? If he could describe the workplace and are there other people who are also suffering, um, working overtime and not getting paid? On average, workers worked 
about 10 hours a day, six days a week, about 60 hours. That's kind of on average. And then there are also severe cases. Uh, some of the workers have to work there and also have to wash the floors. So they have to work kind of like the 60 hour shift every, every week. And then additionally, they would have to also wash the floors, like do just kind of like cleaning around additional five hours. So that's about 15 hours a day. That's the voice of Mr. Tam, who was a worker at the Kington restaurant for over 20 years as a kitchen steward. You're listening to Apex Express on KPFA. Alex, could you talk about the case against the Kington restaurant and what the workers are asking for? For the Kington case, after the restaurant abruptly closed, the workers organized to get the employers to pay back the months of, of back wages that were unpaid. And through that, they contacted the Chinese Progressive Association, and um, they were able to get back partial wages. However, the 11 workers that um, we are working with, um, along with Asian Law Caucus, want to actually get the minimum wage violations, um, break time, overtime violations that are unpaid. And the wage claim that we have uh, totals of over... $450,000. $450,000. And on the legal end, the Asian Law Caucus will be we representing the workers. And in terms of like putting together the campaign, organizing the workers, that is uh, what the Chinese Progressive Association is working on. And right now, the main goal of the campaign is to actually twofold. One is to get the city government to put more resources into minimum wage enforcement and the second piece is actually to make sure that the government puts more pressure onto King Tin Corporation to actually have King Tin the restaurant be more responsible and accountable to the workers. Uncle Tim Uncle Tam, why did you decide to speak out about the unpaid wages and what was it like for you and your co coworkers to come out and say you want your back pay? The reason why they stood up and spoke out is because these are things that they deserve and these are their rights. Before, when they were working at the restaurant, they didn't have any knowledge of what labor laws were like and how it could benefit them. And it wasn't until the restaurant closed that they met people from the Chinese Progressive Association who talked to them about their rights um, in terms of getting their over time, their uh, minimum wage at, uh, at, the, at the new minimum wage of 850 and also break time. So a lot of these kinds of things the workers were unaware of until the restaurant closed and he's hoping that with the help of um, the Chinese Progressive Association and um, the community that they can actually get back what they deserve and the rights. And is Uncle Tam's story a common story for workers in, in San Francisco? Talk about that point of view from the Chinese Progressive Association's work that you do in the community. Leon? Yes, it's, it's typical, you know. Uh, um, unfortunately, you know, used to be, you know, that's two major industry, um, the manufacturing sectors, but particularly in the garment factory, who hire a lot of immigrants, uh, new immigrants who do not speak, mostly do not speak English and do not understand the, the, uh, any of the labor law or wage law and also including the restaurant industry. But because of NAFTA, um, the, all the manufacturing sectors including garment factory has been closing down and moving out of San Francisco. So, you know, the, re- the, the one, uh, the industry that's really high, a lot of immigrants uh, new immigrant Chinese immigrant is the restaurant industry, uh, which probably one of the biggest uh, um, industry that hire new immigrant. And the problem of wage violation and abuse has been so long and so deep within the communities that people just you know assume when they come over, like Mr. Tam, he's been here to, for United States for several decades, but never really uh, aware 
or anybody who introduce or, or outreach to them and have them really take a look at, uh, on you know the job that he's been doing for 20 ye- for 20 years every every month he have his paycheck and pay never really take a look into what is the way you know uh, is that you know he is that the lawful earning that that he received so the the story about having the new immigrant isolated and without giving them outreach and uh, education and understanding is a very big problem here not only Mr. Tam, but you know uh, uh, the other eleven co-workers is pretty much uh, uh, um, a, um, a typical example on the huge population that San Francisco immigrant Chinese worker has been facing, and we all, we that's why one of the reasons that we need to push for is really a lot more more of the uh, education and enforcement. Through the um, through the city themselves, otherwise we will keep on having a uh, population that really relied on public support, and not only this is not healthy, but we don't want to see is for immigrants who really come here to the United States even for decades and still living under you know the substandard levels. That's the voice of Lian Chao, who is the chair of the Chinese Progressive Association. Also joining us is Alex Tom, who is the campaign coordinator for the Chinese Progressive Association, and also Mr. Tam, who was a worker at the King Tin restaurant for 20 years. Alex, why don't you talk about the where the case stands now and what is the future? Where is this case going? What are the next steps that we could look out for? At this point, we are working with the Asian Law Caucus and, um, and other groups, but, but mostly to try to put pressure on the Office of Labor Standards Enforcement, which is the city office in San Francisco that enforces the minimum wage, and additionally with um, DLSE, which is the Department of Labor Standards Enforcement, to actually uh, enforce this um, minimum wage overtime and break time violations. As of now, what we want to do is use a two-pronged approach, and one is to increase the community pressure around uh, this issue to the businesses and to bring more of this kind of um, basically getting people to understand more about what's happening with the case. And on the other hand is to continue with the legal channel and to hopefully make sure that there's going to be um, more resources put into the office to put more in effort into the enforcement. Um, as of now, the um, Office of um, Labor Standards Enforcement, they're on the case and they're actually helping us with doing a lot of the corporate research. However, in, in that office, there there is only about four people and um, while we we, we, as much as we, we appreciate the, um, the assistance that we're getting, we know that for the future cases, for future um, back wage claims for the restaurant industry, the garment industry, or any of these workers, it's going to be very difficult for just four people to handle all this. And what we hope is that we can identify the Kington case to show people that it is definitely a, the tip of the iceberg and that these violations of the minimum wage are widespread in industries concentrated with low-income immigrants, um, such as Mr. Tam. And so we hope that through this and through other um, activities that we have, um, press conferences and even actions, that we can get the public to support the workers more and to and to actually find more information about the employers of King Tin. How can the public support this campaign and the workers if people are interested in helping out with the campaign they can contact me at um 415-391-6986 and that's extension 308 or you can also email me at um a t t o m 38 at yahoo.com and mr tam what do you hope will come out of this case? And what do you want to say to the listeners? How can the listeners help you? These 
佢哋主要嚟讲咧，佢就。These are back wages that that they deserve, and that the Kington Restaurant's business was actually very good, and it wasn't that the business was bad or because of the economy, but it was just that the bosses wanted to make a lot of money and to take advantage of the workers. He hopes that the community will help them and support them in this campaign, and hopes that the boss will、uh, give back their money. And in terms of the the labor laws. Majority of the workers, like himself and the other workers at the restaurant and workers in Chinatown, they don't know about these laws, and they're all new immigrants, monolingual. And hopefully, the government can put more resources into doing outreach and publicity about these labor laws in Chinatown. So he's saying that he worked there for about 20 years, and he he didn't know anything about these laws. Until he saw the newspapers, and from that he he was able to talk to the boss about it, and the boss was saying that business was not good, and that the, he was saying the reason why the boss could do this is because they're new immigrants and they didn't speak English very well or at all, and so the boss just kind of、um, just took advantage of him and to discriminate the workers. So he hopes that the OLSC will put more enforcement, actually just.、Um, Publicize and outreach to workers about their rights,、um, about the new minimum wage and other things, and state labor laws as well. Because if they don't do it, the the boss won't do it, and the workers won't know anything about it. I want to thank you all for joining us today on Apex Express. Lian Chao, who is the chair of the Chinese Progressive Association, Alex Tom, the campaign coordinator for the Chinese Progressive Association, and Tam Pak Wai, who is a 20 years worker at the Kington Restaurant. And also known as Uncle Tam to his coworkers, I want to thank you all for coming on the show today. Thank you. Great, thank you. Yo, back in the day around '88, I was just trying to survive, man. Trying to make a dollar. I remember sleeping in stairways, park benches, even smoking cigarette butts off the floor. There's always a brighter day out there, so just believe in yourself. And we're gonna fly.
150만 원 과품어 애괴로 이제는 그냥 지는 빛자국 붙여진 팔자국 붙여진 꽃자로 숨겨져 머리 나의 머리 숨겨진 나의 눈 너와 함께 슬퍼하리 함께 슬퍼하리 Yes, yes, you're listening to Apex Express. This is music from Drunken Tiger, straight from Korea. And their album is entitled Foundation, and this is their fourth album. So, listen up. You're tuned to Apex Express. My name is Rain. It's the end of October. This is a time that many people celebrate and honor those who have passed on to the spirit world. Right now, we're going to take a little journey into the spirit world through storytelling. Joining us in the studio is Brenda Wong Aoki and Mark Izu. Brenda Wong Aoki is a writer, performer, and storyteller with deep roots in the Asian American community in San Francisco. Mark Izu is an award-winning musician who combines Asian fusion with jazz. He's also the founding member of the Asian American Jazz Orchestra. They're joining us to talk about Ghost Festival 4, Mermaid Me, and other Japanese ghost stories. But before we get into talking to Mark and Brenda, let's hear an excerpt from The Soul of the Great Bell. In a certain city, in a land not far away, a haunted bell waits in silence. The bell is seldom rung because the sound of it rattles the walls of the rich hidden inside their palaces. It starts to trembling the turquoise tiles over the heads of the worshippers kneeling in the temple. Once free, the voice of the bell pours down the mountain, rolls out over the land, and reaches out across the seas. The bell must be struck with a mighty pole made from an enormous tree trunk. And with each blow, the tongueless bell lets forth a wondrous sound like the great golden moaning of a multitude of souls unwilling to be forgotten. And when the immense tones fade away, there can be heard a faint sobbing, like a young girl crying. Then do mothers hold fast to the little ones, and the children cover their ears. Because the people here remember the soul of the great bear. Once, there was a boy whose father taught him the most important thing is to rule the world. The boy grew up and hoping to please his father made himself king. But that was not enough. So with blood and cunning, he conquered country after country until his empire stretched from sunrise to sunset. To pay tribute to his glorious reign, he decided a bell should be made. So singular the sound of it would fill all who heard with shock and awe. That was an excerpt from The Soul of the Great Bell, and you heard the voice of Brenda Wong Aoki in that piece. And this will be featured in this year's Ghost Festival for Mermaid Me and other Japanese ghost stories. And last year you collaborated with Native American storytellers. Mm -hmm. So how do you see the role of the contemporary storyteller? I think it's the same that it's always been since the beginning of time. We don't think of ourselves as like, you know, um, artsy, fartsy, or... (laughs) We think of ourselves like, you know, there's, 
there's guys who who shoe repair guys and there are laundry guys and there are like um you know police officers and teachers and nurses and there are storytellers and musicians we serve a function in society that's really really critical actually what we do is we kind of give vitamins to the human spirit and that's really critical especially now you know ghost festival start, started right after 911 and we were the only show that went on in San Francisco and everybody told us forget it no one will be there but we went on even when the ballet and the opera and everybody had closed we went out on deck at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts and it was a full house like 750 people in the theater because people wanted to, they needed to be together in times of darkness you know Artists are like soldiers, as um, I think it was Queen Latifah who said this. Soldiers, you know, S O U L G E R S. It's like it's just this deep, like thing, hardwired into your your soul. You need it. You need music. You need story. You need for your brain to explode into lots of possibilities. Not somebody telling you this is the way it is, and this is the way you should see it, and this is the way you should feel it where your brain just explodes into lots of different ways of thinking and feeling and, and dreaming. And really only um, performance can, can do that. It can just, you know, take off the, the blinders and just like, let your soul soar. That's the voice of Brenda Wong Aoki, and we're on Apex Express talking about the Ghost Festival 4, Mermaid Me, and other Japanese ghost stories. Also with us is Mark Izu, who composed the music to this festival and is a composer and musician extraordinaire so talk about where you see music fitting into these works because first you have the storytelling or maybe it doesn't come first but you have the storytelling <laughs> how does it fit in does it detract or does it like add that, that chicken out of the egg yeah thing <laughs> came first but um any anyway it's it's really been a pleasure this year we're working with um you know grandmaster seiji tanaka of san francisco taiko and, you know, we just look at each other and he just laughs. He goes, oh, I've known you guys for, you know, 25 years. And this is actually the first time we're really collaborating together. And he was as nervous as us, you know, about doing it because we have known each other for so long. And we've been on so many journeys. And now we're doing this together. And we didn't it, want to mess up a good friendship. It has to be good, you know. And here we are, you know, we've been here this long. And it has to be good. So we're all going, okay, so what are we going to do? But we kind of wrote the script out. For Brenda, it's all basically about the stories. So this one does start with the stories. And how the story is interpreted through the music. Because with this all the great bell, we have him as kind of the bellsmith. He kind of has a sub-character. He doesn't actually act or anything, but his taiko drums and his drums represent the bell. And so that's his whole story is about this guy, this poor guy who has to make this bell that's impossible to make. And if he doesn't make it, he's going to lose his life. And you know, I don't want to give the story away, but he's set with this challenge by this evil emperor. And so it's wonderful. He has these chants he does. They're actually from Shinto chants. And it's just like a prayer, you know, and a kind of a, a prayer for humanity, a prayer for peace, where he starts the peace with. In the middle of the peace, he has another prayer, he says, you know, about when actually everything's going to fall apart. And then at the end, he kind of says a prayer of, of forgiveness. And the music is all built around kind of these prayers. The way we constructed this piece is very different than mostly like music composition. It's more of a, a ritual. And so in, in that way, the music really kind of guides the piece along kind of on a different level, not just like, you know, you hit the bell, it makes a sound. It's more like this, this is representing this whole world that this bell is, is coming from musically. And so it's it's been nice. We don't he, we just let him play. Basically, there's sections where he plays, and Sensei, this is your section. Just play, and he just he just does it. He goes, I'm just looking for emotions. And I go, that's perfect. Your backgrounds are in the traditional storytelling and music fields, and then now you blend contemporary arts within that. So how do you see them intersecting, the traditional and the modern day? Yeah, my training has been in No and Kyogen, and um, I studied with Yuriko Doi in the theater of Yugen here for seven years in the 70s. And then I studied with her teachers, Nomura Mansaku and Nomura Shiro, and they're living treasures now. And then 
I also was trained with um, Commedia dell'arte with the dell'arte Players Company, who are also performing this weekend. And then I took a lot of Afro Haitian and jazz over here at the um, Alice with Malonga. Took mm-hmm. a lot of cla- classes with Malonga. I've always put them all together. I think it's because of my blood, because I'm Chinese, Japanese, um, Spanish, and Scots. I I always feel more comfortable with all these different things. And then I use what feels like it's the thing you're supposed to do. Um, I feel like a, a piece of uh, a performance is like a sculpture. You Like if you look at a piece of wood and the sculptor was going to make, say, um, eagle, you basically sculpt away what is not eagle. And I kind of do the same thing, I think, when I'm choreographing or writing. It just, I'm looking for the essential nature that I feel is like inspired, like given from the, the kami to me, and then try and get rid of all of the stuff that's not its essential nature. And Mark, how do you see the contemporary fusing with the traditional? That's just a, a wonderful concept that that we've been exploring for many years and Brenda s- says this about no that the past, present and future are happening simultaneously and also it's basically music, dance and drama it's not just drama with music it's all three of those art forms are always together so that's when he says you're just so Japanese or you're so Chinese because in Asian art forms they've always been interconnected and it's nothing that's separate in Gagaku it's the same thing there's this thing called Ma and the closest kind of translation of ma in English uh, is the space between the notes. You know, what's between a sound is what makes the sound. And, you know, it's in new music, it's a very kind of avant-garde type kind of concept of, of space. I think they call it negative space or something. But in Japanese music, it's been around, you know, since the beginning. And so this is a lot of stuff I build music from, you know, th- it comes from a nothingness and it evolves out of nothingness and same with words and so when we build something like that then it all comes from the same place and we all start to s- at the same time it's not just um this word you know then you do the sound you're listening to apex express and we're speaking with mark isu and brenda wong aoki and we're talking about ghost festival for mermaid me and other japanese ghost stories let's go to the festival now mermaid me sounds kind of Gross. <laughs> Talk about the stories that you're going to be presenting this weekend, and um, yeah, give us a br- brief idea of what the stories are going to be. So it starts with um, Black Hair, which is a story about the revenge of a samurai's wife. It's sort of um, a battered woman st- story, and then it goes to um, the Soul of the Great Bell, which is a story of the evil em- emperor who wants to have a tribute paid to his glorious reign. We won't mention any names there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what happens when he de- what kind of tribute he does get for his glorious reign. And then the next story is a story about a dancer inside the World War II post and relocation camp. And um, it's like the last dance of a ballerina in the internment camps. And then there's intermission. And then we go to music. Tanaka-san's got this brilliant solo, and then he does this great duet with Mark. And then um, I do a piece called The Bell of Dojoji, which is a uh, no play made famous by the kabuki about a monk who's um, pursued by this evil woman of the flesh. But because I'm a feminist, I turned it around (laughs) and I have it it's kind of a Japanese version of women who love too much and then the final story is mermaid meat and it's a story about a woman who wants to live forever and she eats the flesh of a mermaid and she finds that it's not exactly all it's cracked up to be I wrote all of these stories but some of them were adapted from traditional um, stories but mermaid meat It's kind of fun. Um, I was a substitute teacher in San Francisco at one of the public schools where they were closing the library, and they had all these books all ready to be carted off to Goodwill in cardboard boxes, and I pulled one out on a break. I only had a 10-minute break, 
and it was about mermaids, and I love mermaids. And all I got to read was, if you eat the flesh of a mermaid, you'll live forever. And I remembered that saying for like 10 years. And then finally, we um, we wrote this piece for Kent Nagano and the Berkeley Symphony, and we did it with full symphony. And now we're doing it again um, with Taiko. That's the voice of Brenda Wong Aoki. You're listening to Apex Express, and also Mark Isu is here. And if you're interested in learning more and seeing these ghost stories, the Ghost Festival for Mermaid Me and other Japanese ghost stories is happening this weekend, October 29th through the 30th, 8 p.m. at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts Forum, and also on October 31st at 2 p.m. For more information, you can visit www.firstvoice.org or call for tickets. 415-978-2787. Also, we hear that you better hurry up and buy tickets because they're going very quickly. We're thrilled. That's good. That's good to know. And First Voice is the organization that you work out of. What is First Voice? And Okay, First Voice is um, our nonprofit arts organization. Um, First Voice used to produce the Asian American Jazz Festival, and then in 2000, we started to produce the Ghost Festivals and spun off the Jazz Festival. And First Voice mission statement is to develop the stories and music of people caught between worlds because I'm a Hapa Mestiza person, and I think really my face is what the world is becoming. And... I'm glad that we've always been interested in, in kind of Hapa Mestiza culture, Mestizo culture. There's, I think it's in the nature of our work being multidisciplinary and it's in the nature of the work being Eastern and Western. And I just always remember um, my sensei, Shiro sensei, this is one of those, you know, moments in, in your life you remember forever. He had come from Japan and I'd been the student assigned to drive him. And we were sitting at the cliff house after a long day of, like, interviews and rehearsals, and he dismissed the translator. So we're kind of sitting there looking at each other, but I didn't think he could really understand English, not for, you know, a, you know, a deep philosophical conversation, but I thought, oh, what the heck, I'm feeling so blue. So I told him, you know, um, Shiro-sensei, I don't know what I'm doing studying. No, I started so late, you know, I was, like, in my late 20s, and... You're supposed to start when you're four. And I was a woman, and you're supposed to be a man. And I wasn't even really Japanese, and I wasn't even... Then I said, I'm not really even Chinese. I'm not really... I don't feel like I'm really American. I'm not really nothing. And he goes, Aok-san, he said, you should be excited because uh, you are a new people. The world's becoming a very small place, and people like you are being born every day. And the new people will have new stories and new art forms. So just take the things I'm teaching you and make them yours. And I always remember that was like when he gave me my wings. Make them yours. Mark, has your work in music changed over the years with various new identities coming up in the world as well? Like with the new generations coming through? Yeah, I, I think my, my major influence has been my my teacher, Togi Suonobu, because I've studied with him for over 20 years. He's the Gagaku master. He was a piece of ours a couple of years ago. And then, um, <clears throat> you know, from my background, it's just playing with a lot of African-American musicians and playing jazz. And then getting, having this incredible teacher, the sensei, who taught me Gagaku music, and how this fits in with first voice too, as I've realized over the years, he said something very similar to me, that you know this is yours and and you have to keep moving forward with this. He taught me what he did, and at some point, you know, he said, "Well, that's all there is. What else is there to play?" It's Gagaku's, you know, the world, and so he didn't really think it was necessary to do anything else with it. With it, but since we did this last piece, he basically said, "This is something that." I'm really glad I did. I wasn't sure if I made the right decision coming to America, leaving the court. But now, you know, students like myself and all his other students he had, he really feels that he's done something important. And he's kind of made this whole 
A lot of people who don't know Gagaku, it's just because of him. And a lot of these modern composers, you know, all these different genres, even classical European music, they studied with him. It's affected their music, and he's very proud of that. And so for myself now, our son KK is also in this piece. He's 10, 11 years old, and I feel like I've been given this gift, and now I have to pass this on. And it's not for me to say who, how anyone else is going to use it. It's just to give them the, the knowledge and the, and the wisdom, and hopefully they'll use it to create something that you know I, I could have never imagined. Well, once again, the Ghost Festival 4, Mermaid Me, and other Japanese ghost stories performed by Brenda Wangaoki and Mark Isu, the original composer, with special guest artist Grandmaster Sechi Tanaka of the San Francisco Taiko Dojo. And it's directed by Robin Stanton. And it's taking place October 29th through the 30th at 8 p.m. Matinee on October 31st at 2 p.m. at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. And for tickets, you can call 415-978-2787 and check out their website, www.firstvoice.org. Is there anything else you guys want to add? Yeah, if you come in costume, you get a special Japanese treat. Ooh, get dressed up. <laughs> Special treats. <laughs> I want to thank you both for joining us, Brenda Wong Aoki and Mark Isu on Apex Express. Thank you. Oh, thank you, yeah. We're going to go out with some music by Mark Isu. Called Mermaid in a Silent Sea. Do you want to say anything about it? Well, this was actually written before I did the symphonic version of, of Mermaid, Mermaid Meat. And then from there, it turned into the idea for a symphonic piece. And now it's come full circle again where instead of having a full ensemble play, it's just myself and Tanaka Sensei. So there's two of us. So we're playing another type of version. And like Tanaka always says, it's, it's about the feeling. So this one is more of the essence of what the music is. That is music by Mark Isu. Sounds like a mermaid. feel like I'm in the ocean. We have three pairs of tickets to give away to Mermaid Me and other Japanese ghost stories. This is happening Friday, Saturday, and Sunday this weekend. If you're caller number 11, 12, and 13, you can get those tickets. Three pairs. So give us a call at 510-848-4425. And this is for Yerba Buena to see Mermaid Me and other Japanese ghost stories. We also have tickets to give away for DJ Sep Dub Mission presents Operation Raise the Dead, where ancient ritual meets modern technology. And this is happening at the Elbow Room, 647 Valencia at 17th. And it's on Halloween, Sunday, October 31st. And you have to be 21 and up. From 9 to 2 a.m., this party's happening. So come in costume at the Elbow Room. And we have two pairs of tickets to give away for DJ Sep and Dub Mission, Operation Raise the Dead. It's a Halloween Dia de los Muertos celebration. So call us at 848-4425 and get those free tickets. And you can be caller 15 and 16 or something. Also, happening is Frankenstein this coming weekend. Theater of Yugen brings back its box office hit, a no-distilled adaptation of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. That's happening at Project Arto Theater this weekend, 450 Florida Street at 17th in San Francisco. For more information, check out theaterofyugen.org and 415-621-7978. 
That wraps it up for Apex Express. I want to thank John Watanabe, Samin Yagahi, and Brother Tanje for their technical assistance. And much thanks to Eddie Pei, who's at the controls. I want you to stay tuned for Brother K and the crew with the Filipino Our Story. This has been Apex Express. Celebrate First Congregational Church of Oakland as a center for creativity, peace, and justice, and home of Arts First Oakland with our joint.